Um, thank you, Nick. Uh, I think it's a really good introduction that it's, it's kind of a good talk. So um, I hope that it's actually a good talk. We'll see. Uh, my name is Yael Elmatad. I'm so happy to be here. It's my second time speaking at ML Um I'm also a very short person. So. Um, and uh, I'm a data scientist at TapEd. I've been there almost three years now. Um, and I'm not going to tell you too much about TapEd itself. I really want to teach you about some cool algorithms that I love um, more than I want to sell you my product. But I also want to do that. So a little introduction to TapEd. So TapEd is a marketing technology company that seeks to bridge the gap between users' various screens. So basically what that means is we try to infer that your phone belongs to you and your laptop belongs to you and that those two things are actually one entity. And we do that through uh, probabilistic means, looking at various signals that we use to for these connections. So what we end up with, in, in, a, in a sense, is a graph. It's a network of devices and connections between those devices, which we interpret as relationships indicating that this is the same user or the same household. Um, and if this is a thing that you think might solve one of your problems, let's say you need to scale out, please talk to me. Uh, I, I don't yet work on commission, but I'm sure the salespeople can help me out a little. So doing this actually is quite hard because modeling identity is hard. Dealing with all of these different identifiers and putting them together and munging them presents a myriad of problems. And they range from dealing with identifier persistence. Do people, are people you know, clearing their cookies all the time? Um, how accurate are these identifiers? Conflicting data, if we sync with multiple partners and they both tell us that this ID is the same, you know, how much do we trust that? Uh, grouping keys and transitive properties. So what I mean by that is if A is connected to B and B is connected to C, should we infer, therefore, that C is also connected to A? Um, we have to deal with user privacy and data governance. We don't actually want to know that A and B is John Smith. We just need to know that it's some entity in the universe without getting too personal. And use case flexibility. So we build two main products. One is a, a media product where we actually do paid advertising, and one is a data product where we actually sell our graph uh, to clients, where we give them the projection of their data onto our graph. And they use it for uh, various things like um, attribution, targeting, uh, there's some sort of branding, people who just want to increase their scope. So it's really uh, needs to be able to perform under all of those conditions. So I'm only going to talk about two things because this is a short talk. One is about identifier persistence, and one is about grouping keys. So um, the focus I'm really going to work on first is grouping keys. And so how can we effectively, at scale, determine groups of identifiers? And the second one is going to be persistence. So once we've made those groupings, how do we keep those groupings in time? Um, because we want to make sure that if we have a cluster A, B, C, the next week it becomes A, B, C, D, that A, B, C, D inherits all of the structure from the previous clustering. And then the spoiler alert is there are no classifiers in the stocks, no recommender systems, and there's no community detection or clustering. Um, if you have a problem with that, please talk to Nick Vasiliglou. He's the one who asked me to give this talk. <laughs> so, um, so the first thing I'm talking about is connected components in a network. This is a snapshot of our device graph. This is actual data from our graph. And you can see, uh, to a human eye, it's very clear to pick out the sub subgraphs in this graph. And so each of these represents a household in our data set. And we want to be able to um, pick these out at scales. The problem is we have 1.4 billion devices uh, each week in our graph build. There are 6.6 .6 billion edges. Those are connections between pairs of devices. And the question is, how do we determine these connected components with this much data? So we've made some previous attempts. And they were you know, through various graph-based database type situations where you're using Giraffe, GraphX, Cassavery. Uh, and with our limited engineering understanding, we could not get them to work uh, at scale. Um, so we ended up rolling our own. Um, and the current solution actually runs in logarithmic rounds, which is a really big improvement over standard message passing. So I'm going to tell you the, the algorithm we didn't use first, uh, just so you have some sense of how that usually works. So standard message passing is what you do is you have a set, uh, a small graph like this, A, B, C, D. And what you do is you assign each, each node to have itself as its cluster label in the first round. So in the first round, you have a temporary labeling A, B, C, D. And then what you do is you iteratively say, I'm node A, 
I'm going to ask my neighbors for it, their label, and I'm going to take the minimum label between mine and my neighbor's label. And thus, eventually, the lowest label will propagate to the whole cluster. So if we have this little cluster A, B, C, D, what we will find is A will ask B, B in turn will ask A and C, C will ask B and D, and finally D will go ahead and ask C. And what you'll see is B will end up with a label of A, C will end up B, and D will end up with C. And slowly that A will propagate through that whole cluster. Um, this stops when no, uh, no nodes change their label. That's how you know that you, you've completed your iteration. So this actually takes uh, it's this sort of complexity is in the order of the, the diameter of the cluster. So the longest path is really what's constraining you here. Um, and that's pretty slow. So instead, we found this very nice paper um, written in 2002 about finding connected components in MapReduce and logarithmic, logarithmic rounds. Um, so I showed you that, old, that previous algorithm because I think it kind of gives you some of the uh, impetus for this next algorithm, though this one is quite different. So I, this is a little confusing, so please stay with me for about four minutes. Um, so for node V, where V is these nodes A, B, C, D, and E in my cluster, I'm going to assign, instead of assigning the minimum to be my current label myself, I'm going to look at my neighbors and myself and temporarily assign the minimum of my local environment to me as my minimum cluster. So for A, A is the lowest in this cluster, so it's going to keep that label. B is going to look around and say, okay, that's A. C is going to look around and say, that's B. D is going to look around and say, that's C, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to partition my data so I have all the nodes. They're my Vs. And then CV is going to be the, the union of myself and my neighbors. So A is A and B, B is going to be A and C. Uh, C is actually connected to three nodes, so it's going to have four. And that's sort of its temporary cluster. And what's going to happen in the next round, which is round one, is what I'm going to do is take each of these clusters C, V. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that, the, uh, that V min is the minimum member of my current cluster. And I am going to broadcast the entirety of the cluster to that minimum. So I'm going to ship it all, all there. So I'm going to say, okay, my best guess that my cluster label is the minimum I currently have. Let me send all of my data there. And in, in, in parallel, I'm going to send that minimum to all the members of my cluster and say, hey, guys, this is the best thing I could find. So I'm simultaneously shipping all the data to one node and also telling all the other nodes, okay, this is where I sent you. So what's going to happen here is you're going to see that, let's say for cluster B, it's going to send A, B, C to A, and then it's going to send A to B and C. So the smallest one gets the big set, and the, the, all the other ones get to go to the bigger ones. And so what you see is that each node V will merge all of the CVs that it receives from the V mints. And it's going to look like that. So A now has learned that C is also in its cluster. B actually now has the entirety of the cluster, and it will eventually broadcast everything to A, and so on and so forth. And what you actually see is sort of a two-prong approach. So what's happening is I'm shipping things to the smallest one while simultaneously telling everyone else about what's small. And so that way it sort of starts leaping in powers of two. So you get this really nice logarithmic effect, um, which makes this converge really fast. So now we can run this uh, on our clusters, which don't tend to be too, too big, but with this speed up, we actually can run this. And we actually run this in, I think, three different places in our pipeline week over week, which is, uh, I, I don't know too many people who run these kinds of algorithms at scale. And so eventually this thing will converge when, in this, it's the same criteria, when no nodes change their membership and no nodes change their labels, you know that's the stopping criteria. So this is a, a really, if you ever have to run anything on a graph, if you, even if you're doing things like mapping edges as correlations, for example, between two items, and you can turn that problem into a graph, and you need to find clusters, this is a great method to do that. And I really wish I had known that before I wrote a poor man's version. Um, OK. So we have these connected components, and we have them week over week, and now we have a second problem. And the second problem is, how do we go about labeling them? 
So the first labeling scheme that I just showed you is you take the minimum of your, your neighbors and you say, okay, that's my label, you're the leader, I'm gonna follow you, that's my label. So of course, if you have A, B, C, D, in the end, you end up with a label of A. So if you do this for our data, we find something a little unfortunate. If you use this labeling scheme, uh, and you look at two graphs that you build one after the other, you find that only 78% of devices that are in both of your graphs maintain their label after a single week, which is not good. Uh, it's not something you sell to clients. So what happened to those 22% of devices that changed their label? So the first, first thing that can happen is your leader expires. So for example, someone changes their cookie, someone moves out of a household, uh, someone buys a new device, any of those reasons could be a reason for a device to expire from the graph, and when it does, you change your label. So this nice cluster used to be labeled B, B dropped out of the graph, now it's labeled C, C and D have now lost that consistency. Um, or simultaneously, someone can buy an ID, someone can turn their cookie into a cookie that is smaller, somebody uh, can move in. Um, all of those things can happen, and what you would find is that now this has a new label which is even smaller. These, are, these two situations, you, you feel like they're reasonable. You can understand why they're happening. They're not structurally important to the nature of the problem. They're just sort of a byproduct of the labeling scheme. Now these two are not so good, right? These are cluster splits. So you had these four devices and they were together, and now for some whatever reason, they've broken into two pieces. And so now you have some cluster that still has that label A, but you also now have this other cluster, which used to be part of A, but is really now some new label. And the converse, you get two clusters that come together and they form a new cluster and now C has sort of lost all memory. Uh, so what actually turns out to happen is 75% of the cases are, are of the first type. So the meaning they're not structurally important to the nature of the problem. And 25% are actually the second type, which are structurally important. So this is 25% of 22% is really not a huge amount on the grand scheme of dirty data that we know. So there's a solution, uh, which we like, and we map it onto the stable marriage problem. How many of you have heard of the stable marriage problem? Was, oh, good, excellent. So how many of you don't come from computer science, like myself, I'm a physicist? A lot of you. So probably you guys are the people who have never seen this algorithm, good. Um, so this is the problem, and it sounds really complicated, and we'll show a picture, and it's really simple. So given N men and N women, where each person has ranked all members of the opposite sex in order of preference, marry the men and women together such that there are no two people of opposite sex who would rather be with each other than their current partners. When there are no such pairs of people, the set of marriages is deemed stable. Basically, it means no one would leave their partner for someone who prefers them because they actually prefer their partner to that person. So that would, there, any other alternative pairing would be a trade down for someone. So this is the picture. Uh, I'm gonna go with circles and triangles because our marketing team said I probably shouldn't have men and women marrying each other and proposing. So uh, these are circles and triangles and uh, they, they need to match each other. I know that you and I can't distinguish between circles and triangles but I'm sure they can detect slight asymmetries and preferences. So let's imagine that we have a, a triangle and a circle and they, uh, we match them together and another triangle circle, we also match them together. If the circle that I match with the first triangle actually prefers the triangle I match with the second circle and vice versa, this is an unstable pairing because they would rather be together. That would be preferable to both of them um, than with their current partners. So this is what we want to avoid. Uh, so this is actually, um, I'm going to present the solution which is the Gale Shapley algorithm. This algorithm, like k-means, is very, very old. It's from the 60s. Um, but it won a Nobel Prize in 2012 in economics for doing the, for matching residents to, uh, to uh, medical schools. It's actually a pretty powerful tool. So imagine we have these three triangles, A, B, C, and we have these three circles, beta, gamma, and delta. Here's what we do first. First, each triangle and circle will, will rank the opposite men. one. So uh, A ranks beta, gamma, and delta. You know, beta ranks C, B, and A, etc. Then what we're going to do is we're going to allow the circles to propose to their preferred triangle. So beta is going to uh, request C, gamma is going to re request B, uh, and delta is going to also request C. So here we see 
Uh, beta and gamma are pretty are pretty happy here because uh, because there's no conflict there. But C has to now make a decision. So C looks at the two suitors it has and says, uh, I'm going to go with delta because delta is preferred to me over beta. And beta is going to be left all alone. So what's going to happen is we do this iteratively. So now beta is still dangling out there. So it's going to cross C off of its list and go to its next next best partner. And this next best partner is B. And B looks around and says, like, well, I had gamma, but actually beta is better than gamma. So bye-bye, gamma. I'm going to pick beta. And you see very quickly that now gamma is left out in the cold. And then what finally happened is gamma goes on down its list until it reaches the next best um, pairing, and it finds A. And when every uh, triangle is matched with every circle, we are now done. So how do I use this for my clusters? Well, I have to rank all the clusters I have on both ends. So I have uh, old clusters and new clusters, and I have membership. And I use that membership to determine which is the best new label for me. And then I can actually do this kind of propagation. So we have a few considerations that are a little bit different. Um, how do you rank the best label for your cluster? How do you pick which cluster to inherit from based on your current membership? You do it by the number of devices you have, the number of identifiers you have, um, how, how recent those devices are, for example. Um, so picking that ranking algorithm is actually a lot of part of the science in this. Um, you need to be able to run it at scale for 100 million label pairs. Turns out this algorithm is actually pretty easy to write in MapReduce, so it's not, that's not a problem. Uh, and then you need to be able to handle ties. What happens if um, two, two devices lay claim on a cluster equally, for example? And you need to be able to handle label expiry and new label creation. This is what I call the uh, November Donald Trump problem, when whole clusters will move to Canada. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> um, so don't, don't do that. Uh, don't make my data science job hard. So, um, so what actually happens, so this is, uh, of course, I'm telling you this, so it must have worked out well for me. Um, so if you look at the old method of labeling, I told you there was a 78% consistency. When we switch to this scale shapely based approach, we get 98% consistency. Because as I told you, most of the changes to my labeling were not structurally relevant. They were just kind of based on the ephemeral nature of the labeling scheme. Uh, and if you look eight weeks out, which was very depressing at first, where only a third of our devices had maintained their labeling, now we're up to about 87%. And it should be noted, we build the graph on 60 weeks, 60, I'm sorry, 60 days of data. So eight weeks literally means that this data is almost completely non-overlapping, and we're still getting 87% consistency in our clustering. So, in conclusion, uh, so many challenges that get thrown at us as data scientists, I feel, you know, people say like, oh, this is a data science problem. Here, data science, you solve this problem. And what it turns out is sometimes they're not actually machine learning problems. They can be easily solved by deterministic engineering algorithms. Um, and so being familiar with these algorithms prevents data scientists from reinventing the wheel. And I've now been burned by this by like four times because these algorithms that I presented to you, I had to reinvent myself. So, um, and then someone, some engineer said to me, oh, I know that algorithm. I learned it in my third year algorithm class. I said, why didn't you tell me this before you made me do it? Um, and then once you start using these algorithms, you start seeing use cases for them everywhere. And so just like I said before, if you have a bunch of correlations, anything that you can represent as a graph, you can run connected components at scale on it. You can, you, you can cut you know, the lower correlations and only keep the highest ones. And, and you've now found an algorithm for determined clusters, um, which is deterministic. And then uh, same goes for this matching. Anytime you have to match two entities and you, you want to pick the best pairing, as long as you have a ranking function, you can do Gale Shift on it. Um, and so I just really wanted to proselytize for these two algorithms and hope that maybe more people will use them. Um, thank you. Uh, I want to tell you about our, our blog, which sometimes gets updated. I want to tell you that we're hiring because they told me I had to. And I want to tell you uh, that, that we are on Twitter, um, and you can follow me. Sometimes I rant about uh, the US Postal Service. So it's a really fun time. Thank you. Thank you.